Good morning, New Heights. It is great to be back with you this morning. I want to welcome you back to our series in the Gospel of Mark. Do me a favor. Open your Bibles or Bible devices to Mark chapter 7. Now, before we dive into the text, I want to start with four quick observations. First observation, so far in the Gospel of Mark, much of Mark's material focuses on what Jesus did. But our text this morning is filled with what he said. There's a switch going on here this morning. Much of Mark's Gospels record the miracles of Jesus. You might remember last week, Jim pointed out seven of them. In our verses this morning, we get to hear his message. Second observation, from this point forward in Mark's Gospel, we see the popularity of Jesus begin to decline. Moving forward, the final year of his life, Jesus pours more and more time into the disciples while the religious leaders ramp up their confrontation. As Jesus exposes their superficial spirituality, they become more and more agitated and they attack him relentlessly to discredit him and eventually send him to his death. Thirdly, the word tradition is used six different times in this passage. Now, while tradition can be a good thing, Jesus is going to show us that tradition must always be subservient to Scripture, not the other way around. Last observation, Mark chapter 7 and verse 7 is the key verse that will help us unpack this section. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Now, underline the word vain. Vain means groundless, invalid, and hypocritical. This morning, we're going to talk about legalism. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about legalism because the passage does. Another word for being religious and not righteous is legalism. Now, this word gets thrown around a lot, so we need to be sure what we mean by the term. So here's my my twofold definition. Biblical, Biblical legalism is, number one, treating certain standards as regulations, which are kept by our own power in order to gain favor with God. Here's the second definition. Creating certain codes of conduct that go beyond the teaching of the Bible, and making conformity to these codes critical to being a quote-unquote real, real Christian or part of the group. Now, the danger with the first definition is that we try in our own power to be moral. And the second definition is problematic because it's an attempt in our own power to make the church pure. Both are failures to trust God and His power. Both have self-worship at the root, and both are just as sinful as, as rampant depravity. The depraved person, the sinful person, uses risky and sinful behavior to worship themselves. And the legalist uses rules and regulations to worship themselves. Legalism is scary because of the level of self-deception. Now, let me explain. A depraved person knows that they're a sinner. They may or or may not feel guilty, but they, they just don't care. They just don't care to change. But a legalist doesn't think they need to change. That's the problem. They don't think they're a sinner because they feel religious. The legalist thinks unrighteousness, well, it's everyone else's problem. So, in our text today, our text today highlights an exchange between the legalistic rulers and Jesus. And it highlights the contrast between legalism and real righteousness. So this morning, I want to give us five characteristics of a legalist. And then I I want to finish with Jesus' response. So, first characteristic of a legalist. Legalists are are aggressive. Verse 1 begins with a simple statement. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Lee, wait a second. That, That sentence doesn't sound aggressive. It sounds informative. Do you remember where we left Jesus? You remember last week? We left him in Gennesaret, which is a city on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now, I figured out that it's, it's over 100 miles from Jerusalem to Gennesaret. So, to give you a sense of, of the distance, consider that it's just over 100 miles to travel from Fayetteville to Tulsa. And if we were to walk nonstop, I don't recommend it, it would take us 35 hours. So, this is a significant trip for these guys to make. And given the fact that Mark says, Pharisees and teachers of the law, it implies that this was a good-sized posse. This was a religious delegation. So it seems likely that these were high-ranking religious rulers who were highly motivated to ask Jesus a question. And these religious rulers were aggressive enough to travel a long, long distance. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves in our study, but realize that they walked over 100 miles to ask Jesus a really important question. 
Why don't your disciples wash their hands before they eat? Seriously? That's it? Aggressive action is a typical part of of legalism. Why? Because action and control and doing stuff is the main manifestation of their self-worship. And this simply reflects the core problem of legalism. That is, a reliance on self. Therefore, legalists are usually very aggressive with themselves and others. They not only believe that there must be a certain way of doing things, but their spiritual pride causes them to feel like they are self-appointed guardians of the truth. And their mission in life is to help others, quote-unquote, see the true way, which happens to be their way. So, first characteristic, legalists are aggressive. Second characteristic, legalists look for lawbreakers. If you look hard enough, you can always find something to get upset about. The Pharisees and and teachers of the law not only gathered together, but they they play gotcha with the disciples. Mark chapter 7 and verse 1, again, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who, who had come from Jerusalem, they gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled. That, that is, they, had, they hadn't washed their hands. Now, does this mean that the disciples were practicing bad hygiene by, by not washing up before dinner? No. No, something deeper is going on. And I love how Mark helps his readers understand more about this in verse 3. Now, notice the parentheses around these verses. He does this to give some cultural background to those who, who aren't Jewish. Remember, that Mark's primary audience is made up of of Gentiles living in the Roman Empire. So he's trying to be culturally sensitive to his readers. Mark chapter 7 and verse 3. The Pharisees and and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. Verse 4. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. The word holding, you might want to underline that, refers to grasping firmly. That means they are stubbornly adhering to the tradition of the elders. Now, is it a a bad thing to wash one's hands before eating? Not at all. We should all do this, like every time. But but here's what, what happened. The Bible never says that everyone must do this. The only reference I I could find was for priests to wash their hands and feet before entering the tent of meeting in Exodus chapter 30. So, what began as something good became a tradition that that ended up binding and blinding the people to what really mattered. Over time, the traditions of the elders were eventually put into something called the Mishnah, which was a a collection of, of oral traditions. Incidentally, the the Mishnah has over 35 pages alone devoted to to washing. Oy vey. These regulations were then put into the Gemara, which was like a commentary. And then the Mishnah and the Gemara were then combined to form the Talmud. Now, with that as a background, verses like Luke chapter 11 and verse 46 take on more meaning when Jesus said this, And you experts in the law, woe to you. Because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to actually help them. In contrast to this, Jesus makes this wonderful offer in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. First characteristic, legalists are aggressive. Second characteristic, legalists look for lawbreakers. Third characteristic, legalists like to sound spiritual. Part of legalism's power is that it has just enough truth attached to it that at first it almost seems as if it's right. And that's because legalism has truth as a part of its DNA. Somewhere along the line, someone added something to a biblical truth. And then over time, people began to focus on the addition and not the original truth. This is what happened during Jesus' time. The religious rulers traveled over 100 miles in order to ask Jesus a question. Here it is again, Mark chapter 7 and verse 5. 
So the Pharisees and teachers of the law, they asked Jesus, why, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? The religious rulers had taken laws that applied to priestly purity and applied it to all Jews. This is where we need to be careful. Often the seeds of legalism are laid in spiritual experiences. Then they are mandated directly or indirectly on other people. For, for example, you receive Christ by walking down an aisle and you begin to think that every service should have an altar call. If it doesn't have an altar call, it's not a good church. Oh, here's one. God blessed your heart through a particular song or type of music, and you think that real worship is found only in those songs or that style. Here's another. You've been blessed by using a particular method or, or content for studying the Bible, and you begin to talk in such a way that everyone has to study the Bible like this. Last one. God showed up in a particular area of ministry, and you think that everyone has to be involved in that ministry. And if they're, if they're really going to serve the Lord, they got to do that ministry. Do you feel the tension? I could go on and on all about the good things that, that became overbearing because the spiritual value of a form was morphed into a mandate. Legalists are aggressive. They look for lawbreakers. Gotcha. They like to sound spiritual. Fourth characteristic. Legalists sadly have a disconnection with true spirituality. At its core, legalism is a covering for a, a subtle, self-centered rebellion or spiritual pride. Jesus cites Isaiah chapter 29 to, to make his point. Mark chapter 7 and verse 6, he, Jesus, replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. What an indictment to religious people. He says that what's coming out of your lips is not, not what's really in your heart. And what you're teaching the people is not really the commandment of God. Thus, Jesus is accusing them of a fundamental fakery that is outrageous. In their worship of God, they have actually driven him out. And this is, this is always what happens with legalism. And it's tragic. Religious activity, which was supposed to be about God and His glory, it becomes about us. Rules are, are written in the name of protecting the people from sin, which in fact, the rules only create more sin. And the things that a person thought would draw him or her closer to God only serve to create further distance as the person works harder and harder. But it's never enough. And the reason is because the real end game in legalism, it, it, it's not God, but self. It's a sad sort of virtue signaling. Look at me. I'm so godly. Look at me. I'm so holy. Last characteristic of legalists. Legalists have an unbalanced focus. The underlying problem is, is, that, they, is that the focus shifts and there is a lack of balance. That's what Jesus says in Mark chapter 7, and verse 9, and he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corbin, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Now, don't miss what Jesus is saying here. The legalist creates additional commands in order to keep the law, but in doing so, they actually break the law. In this case, the religious rulers had created a law called Corbin. Corbin allowed for a person to neglect the provision of their parents because they, they had dedicated money to the temple. Therefore, someone could, could claim that they, they weren't able to meet the needs of a family because, well, you know, sorry, those resources have already been pledged to God. Thus, a, a child could, could tell their parents that they're unable to take care of them because the money is being dedicated to a, a spiritual building. Ironically, the person who pledged the money could also access the money without penalty. Look, everybody, 
I'm giving it to God, but really I'm giving it to me. Sorry, mom and dad. The problem with legalism is that it, it sounds spiritual, but it's unbalanced. In other words, legalism forgets what's really important. It loses its spiritual moorings. Jesus says that legalists end up creating the very thing they were trying to avoid, disobedience. So these are the five characteristics of legalism. But let me, let me give us two cautions. First caution, if we are more prone to think of someone else as we went through this section, rather than ourselves, we might be a legalist or at least on our way to becoming one. So beware. Secondly, we must constantly, daily be on guard for the subtle seeds of legalism that creep into our hearts. We must pray that we'll be righteous and not religious. Okay, let's finish with Jesus's explanation. Verse 14, again, Jesus called the crowd to him and he said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, he, he took his disciples aside and he asked them about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that, that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? Verse 19, for it doesn't go into their heart. He's pretty graphic here, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared, all food's clean. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Now let me summarize Jesus' word with one sentence. The heart of the problem is the heart. Here's another way to say it. The real problem with all of humanity is internal, not external. The real problem, says Jesus, is what comes out of a person. In other words, the religious rulers overestimated the importance of external issues. Why? Because they have minimized the internal issues. Real righteousness begins by understanding that the real problem is inside of us. It's me not outside of us. And this is the difference in Christianity from all other religions. Every other belief system or worldview believes that externals are what God is really interested in. But Jesus tells us that we are the problem. And that is why the cross is central to our faith. Jesus had to pay our debt. Jesus had to change what we could not change on our own. To illustrate this, Jesus uses a crude example. If you eat a piece of unclean food, he says, it goes into your mouth and down to your stomach. And eventually, he says, it, it goes in, into the sewer. It never gets to your heart. It doesn't touch your heart. So the problem is actually more serious than we think because all the hand washing in the world, all the external man-made rules never get to the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue is that we have impure hearts. The problem is that at our core, there's something seriously wrong. So this passage, it shows us the extent of our problem. It also shows us the impossibility of cleansing ourselves. So here's the question. What do we do? Well, there's an interesting parenthetical comment at the end of verse 19. I want to go back there for just a second. It's significant because Mark rarely makes any editorial comments. But he says this. In saying this, Jesus declared... All foods clean. Now, what does Mark mean by this? Well, there are all kinds of laws about clean and unclean food in the Old Testament. What Mark is telling us is that Jesus is the fulfillment of all these laws. And that he has now made a declaration. It's like a legal declaration that all of the laws about clean and unclean food, they're now obsolete. Hundreds of years earlier, God revealed that the day would come that he would deal with his problem. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all of your idols. And here's what I'm going to do. I'll give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you. And I'm going to remove from you your heart of stone. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. 
And I'm, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my spirit in you and, and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then, then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You'll be my people and I'll be your God. And I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and I'll not bring famine upon you. The day will come, God said, when we won't, we won't have to worry about our unclean hearts. Not anymore. Why? Because God will give us a new heart. God promises that I will save you from all your uncleanness. One of the most beautiful pictures of this is found in a passage in the Old Testament book of Zechariah. You probably haven't read that lately. Maybe you have. But Zechariah sees a scene in heaven in which Joshua, the high priest at the time, appears before God. So picture this. We're in the throne room of God. Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 1. Then he showed me, Joshua the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. And this is wild. And Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. Now, do you remember how much work the priests had to go through in order to, to cleanse themselves? The high, high, the high priest would, would only come before God once a year at Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. But only after a week of preparation because he couldn't appear before God in an unclean state. And this was a big deal because he would go into the Holy of Holies and he would atone for the sins of all the people. He was their representative before God and they were literally, physically cheering him on. Go, go, yes. So Zechariah sees Joshua appear before God and Satan is there to accuse him. And we read this, verse three. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes Huh? As he stood before the angel. Now in the original, it says he, he is, his clothes are covered with excrement. I don't need to explain that. And this is a picture of how we must look to God as we come before him in all of our unrighteousness. He's there on the day of atonement, but there's big trouble because he's unclean. There's no way he can stand before God. And Satan is there. He's getting ready to accuse him. It's a disaster. And you're saying, well, Lee, what's going on here? Here's what I think is going on. God was giving Zechariah a prophetic vision so that he could see us the way God sees us. In spite of all of our efforts to be pure, to be good, to be moral, to cleanse ourselves, God sees our hearts, and our hearts are full of filth. All of our morality, all of our good works, they don't really get to the heart. And Zechariah suddenly realized that no matter what we do, we're unfit for the presence of God. But just as he was about to despair, just before Satan, the accuser of God's people, can even speak, the angel says this, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I've taken away your sin. I will put fine garments on you. Look at verse 8. Now, now, here's what I'm going to do. I, I, I'm going to bring my servant, the branch, capital B, the branch, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. God strips away his uncleanness and provides clothes that he couldn't provide for himself. He's reclothed in God's presence. He comes before God covered with excrement, and in God's presence, he's given ceremonially pure garments as a sign that God accepts him. And he accepts the people that he represents. Are, are you ready for this? God, and only God, will take away our filthy clothes in his presence. And Satan, our accuser, won't even be allowed to say a word. But how does that happen? It happens because centuries later, another Joshua showed up. Another Yeshua, Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua. It's the same name in Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew. Another Joshua showed up. And he staged his own day of atonement. But the people didn't cheer him on. Nearly everyone he loved betrayed, abandoned, or denied him. And when he stood before God, instead of receiving words of encouragement, the father forsook him. Instead of being clothed in rich garments, he was stripped of the only garment he had. He was beaten. And he was killed naked. Why? Because as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God clothed Jesus in our sin. Yours and mine. He took our penalty. 
our punishment so that we, like Joshua the high priest, can get what Revelation 19 pictures. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder. They were shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. You ready for this? Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Through Jesus Christ, at infinite cost to Himself, God has clothed us in costly, clean garments. It cost Him His blood. And it is the only thing that can deal with the problem of our hearts. Not good works, not education, not houses, not cars, not the right spouse, not family, not substances, and certainly not politics. Christ and Christ alone is our only hope. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in Him is mine. Alive in Him, my living head. And clothed in righteousness divine, bold I approach the eternal throne. And claim the crown through Christ, my own. Father, we repent. We repent of our efforts to cleanse ourselves. We can't do it. We need you. And we thank you that in your presence, our filthy clothes can be removed. And we can be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. May everyone here experience that. Experience that cleansing and declare amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me. I want to give us all some great news if we know and love Jesus. Jesus said on the cross that it's finished. It's finished. So if we know and love Jesus, we've repented of our sin and turned to Him as Savior and Lord. Our sins are in the past. We can now live in victory. We can live with the power of the Holy Spirit. We've got new garments on. Rejoice in that. The Bible says if for some reason you struggle and, and you sin, go back to him and just say, God, cleanse me. Fill me with your spirit. For some of you here who are watching, it's been about works. It's been about stuff. It's been about try, trying to somehow get through life and satisfying yourself with the things of this world. And you're empty and you're like, well, what does it take? It takes a new heart. So I, I beg you this morning, I beg you, evaluate where you're at right now. The Bible says that if you, if you come to Jesus, He won't cast you aside. Maybe today is the day for your salvation. It's not about what you do, what you wear, how educated you are. It's about a new heart. Maybe today is the day you say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I desperately need you. Cleanse my heart. Forgive me. I give myself to you now as Savior and Lord. I turn from that sin and I turn to you. The Bible says when that happens, you become a brand new creation. As it says in Ezekiel, your heart of stone now becomes a heart of flesh. You become alive in Christ. My prayer is that that happens today.